Acts chapter 19, page 1099. Well, if you've been at our church uh, for any length of time this year, you've probably heard one place or another this, this theme that we've been focusing on that we've entitled Engage. Uh, and and our, our focus this year has been trying to motivate ourselves and equip ourselves to engage people with the gospel, uh, that we might as a church be better at talking to people about Jesus and, and not just being kind of passive but more active in sharing our faith in different ways. But you know, I was thinking, maybe there's an easier way to do this. Maybe this whole engage idea is just a little bit, it takes a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, a lot of risk. And I thought, you know, I came up with another idea, and I just wanted to float it by you. See what you think, okay? So here's the idea. Gospel blimp. What do you think? Gospel blimp, all right? Just work with me on this. We pull our money, we hire the Goodyear blimp, okay? And maybe like 4th of July, with a lot of people out, and, and we fly it over Boston, and, uh, or maybe like we hired for two days and we hired Boston and the Cape, something like that. And what we do is, you know how there's like the, the words that, that go around on the Goodyear blimp? Like we could just put like the gospel on that, right? And so people look up and they'd be like, there's, what's the Goodyear, Je- Jesus died to save sinners like me? What, you know? Oh, you know, maybe we could just do that. I mean, that would be great. Uh, it, would, it would be efficient. We could probably reach hundreds of thousands of people rather than just the few people we would reach if we just tried to engage a little bit more. Who knows, it might make it on the news, might even go on the internet and go viral. We could have an international gospel blimp ministry just beamed out over the world. And, and we're all busy anyway. I mean, you know, do we really have time for, to engage? So why don't we just do the gospel blimp? It's, it's an idea. I think we should discuss it. Well, okay, I'll be honest. It's not actually my idea. There was a movie in 1967 called The Gospel Blimp, which was just about that very idea, and I think it was a a, a satirical movie. There's problems with the gospel blimp idea. I mean, it's great to tell people the message of the gospel, uh, but, but gospel ministry is more than just shouting the message at someone and saying, check, I did it. Gospel ministry is more than just speaking the message of Jesus, although I hope you Don't get me wrong. If you've been here, you know we've got to tell the gospel message. I mean, I hope you've heard that again and again. And yet what we see is the gospel ministry is not only bringing people to faith in Christ, but it's helping them grow up in their faith in Christ. The gospel ministry that we see in the Bible is not just about winning converts, but it's about maturing disciples. It's not just about evangelism. It's also about discipleship. It's not just about hoping that people will be born again, but it's helping people grow up again in their faith. And so as we do gospel ministry, we have to have a a bigger vision than that, and uh, a gospel blimp just won't do the trick. It takes time and lives together. Well, look at Acts chapter 19. Here we have a story, a pretty weird story. Today we get into a story that's hard to understand. I, I can't even say I fully can explain to you what's happening in this passage in some ways. It's, it's strange. And for that matter, all of chapter 19 is, gets kind of wild and woolly. So if, if you like sort of the, the bizarre and the strange, you'll enjoy chapter 19 as we work our way through it. A lot of strange things happening in this passage. But, but here we have this interesting story where Paul meets these disciples who are kind of half-baked. They're, they're kind of disciples, but they, they have all kinds of issues. They're things where they need to grow. And we see that, that what they need is further teaching, further growth, further maturation. They need more than the gospel blimp. They need somebody to engage with them and to teach them and to help them continue growing in their faith. So let me read the first seven verses to you. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. 
And there were about 12 men in all. So here's Paul, and he's in the middle of his, what we, is often called his third missionary journey. So if you're here last Sunday, we saw the wrap-up of his second missionary journey where Paul went from Palestine, uh, the land of Palestine, and he went up through Asia Minor, or what we call Turkey today, and then down through Greece from north to south, and then back to Antioch, and he made a full loop. But then at the end of the passage last Sunday, we saw that he launched off on his third missionary journey. This time he just went back through Turkey, uh, Asia Minor, and he was, he was just kind of re encouraging and revisiting the churches that he had started before on his first and second missionary journeys. So if you look back at chapter 18 uh, and look at verse 23, it says, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So again, Galatia and Phrygia, part of modern day Turkey, traveling through that region. And he finally comes to Ephesus. So Ephesus is, think of Turkey sticking out here into the Mediterranean. Here's the Mediterranean Ocean, and Greece is over here. So, so if that's Turkey, right on the west coast, right in the middle is where Ephesus would have been. It was a major metropolitan center, um, had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was there, the, the Temple of Artemis. It was a big happening place, and Paul arrives there. And that's where he meets these people. He meets these, these 12 or so guys, Right? And he gets talking to them, and he's asking them questions about what they believe, and, and he's, he must have picked up that something weird was going on here. And so, so he asks them, he's like, did, so did you guys get the Holy Spirit? And they go, uh, we didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. And then he goes, well, who baptized you? <laughs> well, John baptized us. Now, now, when he says John, you know, we were baptized the baptism of John, who's John? John the Baptist, all right? So if you know the story of Jesus a little bit, you'll know the story that when Jesus first started his ministry, when he first began to, to do miracles and teach, there was a guy who came just before him named John who is often called John the Baptist. And the reason we call him John the Baptist is that he was baptizing people. John came and he was meeting people at the Jordan River and baptizing them. And, and what was happening was that the Jewish people were repenting of their sins to get ready for the Messiah. John's message was, the Messiah is about to come, get ready, repent, and get baptized as a sign of your repentance, right? And so, so these people, these guys have been baptized by John. Now, here's the, here's the freaky thing. This is what's so weird. John's baptism happened around like 30-ish A.D. This story in Acts 19 was like 55-ish A.D., so this is 20 to 25 years after John the Baptist. And somehow they kind of missed out on everything. Like they didn't know the day of Pentecost had happened. They hadn't been baptized with a Christian baptism. It's kind of like they're in this weird time warp. You know, it's, it's like he meets these guys and they're a blast from the past. Like all they really know is John's baptism. Like how can you not know this? Were you, were you like, you know, asleep for 25 years? Were you like Han Solo and Carbonite, like frozen, and then, you know, you woke up 25 years later? Did Doctor Who pick you up in his time machine and take you to the future, and you didn't know about all this stuff that happened? Like, this is, it's just odd. It's very odd. And, and Paul doesn't really know what to make of these guys. Of course, it even raises the question, are these guys even Christians? Are, are they disciples of Jesus? Some, some say, no, they're not. I mean, they have to come and believe in Jesus. Others say, yeah, I think they may be Christians, but they're just really poorly taught, and they're kind of stuck in the past, and they're unaware of some things that have happened. How do you know how to interpret a passage like that? Are these guys Christians? Are they not Christians? Um, well, you have to look at the context. That's how we interpret the Bible. We look at the context. And I lean, I'm on the other the side that says, I think these guys are Christians. They're, they're really followers of Jesus, but they just are really poorly taught, and they're kind of behind on some things. Let me tell you why I think that. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. It says, there he found some disciples. They're called disciples. And most of the time in the book of Acts, when you see the word disciples, if not every time, it, it refers to Christians, disciples of Jesus. Or look at verse 2. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they've believed. And again, you look at the word believed in the book of Acts, and it's always something that Christians do. Christians are the believers. They're the ones who have believed. So, so he's using language that elsewhere in the book of Acts is commonly ascribed to Christians. 
Not only that, but I think this story takes place in, in a series of stories where the theme that we see occurring again and again is Christians who need to grow up more and, and be matured. Christians who've been converted, but they need to, to progress in their faith. There's more growing to do. So, for instance, look at back at chapter 18, verse 23. That's where the story starts. Paul, again, is traveling throughout a Galatian Phrygia on his third missionary journey. And what does it say at the end of verse 23? Strengthening all the disciples. So his journey is to strengthen disciples. And so here he is in chapter 19, strengthening disciples. Or look at um, verse 24. It says, uh, remember the story of Apollos. We studied this last week in chapter 18, verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. And this guy was, he was awesome. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Weird. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So here's a superstar. He's kind of a rock star. He's doing a lot of teaching. He's got a lot of fervor. He's doing a good job. But he hasn't been baptized in Christian baptism. And there's still a few things he doesn't know. So uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they invite him over for dinner or something. And then they start to explain. They start to fill in the gaps and tune up his theology. You know, whenever I read that passage, I always wish I could have been there. Like, what what did he not know? I wonder what they told him that he didn't know. It's just, you know, curious. Well, maybe we can all ask them someday what that Bible study was like. But there it is again, a Christian disciple who's being strengthened and who's growing more. And then you have our story uh, of the the disciples, these disciples being strengthened and growing more. And then even next week, we're going to look at this next week, and I don't want to go there fully yet, but next week, as we'll see, is a story of a botched exorcism. It's really weird. Perfect for Mother's Day. Botched (laughs) exorcism. Mother's Day, botched exorcism. I mean... (laughs) Perfect. But as a result of this botched exorcism, what happens? Look at chapter 19, verse 17. We'll we'll get into this more next week. But it says, when this becomes known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Verse 18, get this. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. So these are believers who are now confessing evil deeds and believers who are repenting of sorcery. Wow. So so it seems to me it's, it's a series of stories about believers or disciples who are continuing to grow, that the Christian life doesn't just end when you believe in Jesus and are converted or saved, but that that's actually the beginning and that there's a process of maturation and growth and change and education and learning and development that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives. So whatever these guys are, however it is that they managed to go 25 years and not hear that there was a Holy Spirit, (laughs) here's the question. What does Paul do with them? What do we do with people and with ourselves when we see these deficiencies and gaps in our Christian life, where where we know we should be here, but we're still here. I've been a Christian 20 years, and yet I'm embarrassed to admit that I still don't blah, 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 where where there's holes and and shortcomings, shortfalls in our Christian life. What, What do you do? You know what Paul does? He engages. You engage. You press into a person. You you. you engage, you talk to them, you push your life into their life, and you share, and you open your life, and you open God's Word. God grows us through the ministry of the Word and relationships. And so look what Paul does. If you get this weird situation, I can't fully explain it to you, but what Paul does is pretty simple. Verse 4, he teaches. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. He goes, look, you guys got John's baptism, that's great, but John's baptism was just to get you ready for Jesus, and then once Jesus came, John falls out of the picture. You guys need to have Christian baptism, and he explains to them more. He teaches, 
And then number two, he baptizes. Verse five, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Jesus. They take up the basic mark of Christian discipleship, which is baptism as believers. And then he prays for them. He he lays hands on them. He's praying over them. Verse six, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about 12 men in all. So, so it's sort of like the day of Pentecost, which happened 25 years earlier, gets catapulted forward into the present, and these guys have their own little personal private day of Pentecost experience as, as they're kind of caught up with the rest of the Jewish believers who had been there. It, 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 you know what I mean? It's a strange experience. I can't even, I don't fully understand that. Just that Paul prayed and the Holy Spirit came. But I think it's, it's Paul being again affirmed as an apostle. Just as Peter laid his hands on the Samaritans and prayed and they got the Holy Spirit, Paul lays his hands on people and prays and they receive the Holy Spirit. But the point is, God is working through Paul and his ministry to them to help kind of catapult these guys forward, fast track them in spiritual growth to get them back on track so they can catch up with the rest of the Christians in the world. Because gospel ministry is not just about evangelism, though that's where it starts. It's also about discipleship. It's not just about making converts. It's about growing people up in their faith. It takes more than a gospel blimp. We have to open our lives and open our mouths and open our Bibles and press in and engage, and God uses that to keep building people up in their faith. You know, what's missionary work? Our church supports missionaries. We love our missionaries. But really, what does a missionary do? Well, they go to another place another culture, they cross a boundary, they go to another people group, they get to know that place, and then they share about Jesus. And some of those people in that place maybe come to faith. And so does the missionary say, well, mission accomplished. I can go home. No, it just started. Then those people need to be baptized, and they need to be congregated into a church. And then that church needs to be built up and taught, and maybe they need the Bible translated into their native tongue, because it hasn't been done that way yet. And then that church needs to be established. And at some point down the road, and it may be a couple generations, that church eventually is strong and it starts sending out its own, its own people and its own missionaries. And that whole process can take time. But that's the whole process of making disciples. It's not just a one-off gospel blimp attack, but it's an ongoing life process. And so we all, we all need to be growing. We all need to be expecting Christian growth. And, and I emphasize this. I really, obviously, am trying to drive this home because I think it's one of those doctrines that you and I probably all would agree with. We'd probably say, yeah, 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 I know Christians are supposed to grow. And I'm like, no, no, really, Christians are supposed to grow. Yeah, 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 I know that. No, no, really, <laughs> Christians are supposed to grow. And I say that because I think often we don't grow or we're not growing. It's possible to be stuck in the Christian life and to go years like these people and kind of be clueless about some things. Just because I've been a Christian for 30 years doesn't mean that I'm spiritually mature in every way. We can be stuck and frozen and we need to grow and we're not growing. Why is it that we don't grow sometimes? Why is it that we get stuck? Why is it that we we just are in some kind of time warp where I've been a Christian for 30 years, but there's some real immaturity in my life? I mean, there's probably a number of reasons we don't grow. Um, I think one of the reasons is it's easy to confuse Christian activity with spiritual growth. And even though those things are connected to each other, they aren't synonymous. And so it's possible to be an active Christian in some ways, but not be really growing and to mistake the two. Um, you know, we can be active. We can go to church, go to a Bible study, help out in the church, do this, do that, and be, spend a lot of time doing a lot of activities, but we're not really growing. You know, imagine someone says to you like, hey, so uh, how, how do you feel like you're growing in your Christian life? And you go, well, you know, I guess I'm growing. I mean, you know, I've, well, I've been going to church regularly. That's good. It's really, it's been a great thing. I enjoy my church and got into a Bible study finally, I know, you know, and that's been good, going to a growth group. And, and actually, yeah, you know, now that I think of it, I started helping out with the, uh, the, the ushers. I'm ushering now at the church and this, you know, I got to meet a few new people. Or maybe you're, you're a student and you're like, I'm going to Sunday school every week. I'm going to youth group. and Yeah, so, so I, think, I think it's going good, you know. And, and the friend says, 
yeah, but are, are you growing? You know, well, what do you mean? Well, uh, like, what, what sin are you currently trying to really kill in your life? You know, where are you trying to grow in holiness and obedience? You say, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I never thought about it that way. Huh, that's kind of weird. Okay, well, um, what is God teaching you about himself? You know, what's he teaching you about yourself, and what's he teaching you about himself? What, what are you really learning about God, and, and how are you growing in your understanding and your love for God? Um, like, you mean the sermon I heard last Sunday? No, 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 what are you learning? Uh, well, you know, am I really growing? Who, who, are, who are you ministering to? How is God using your spiritual gifts to build up and edify others? I'm not even sure I know what my spiritual gifts are. I'm not sure. And so we're, we're stuck. You know, it's like Paul talking to these people who are like, I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And so we get stuck like that, and we don't grow. Because we can easily confuse Christian activity, all of which is good, with Christian growth. And often the activity done with, for the right reasons can foster growth, but it's the growth we're looking for. Or here's another reason, a second reason sometimes I think we don't grow, and it's this, that in order to grow, this is the hard thing, you have to admit and accept that there are deficiencies. You can't grow as long as you think you're all set. Any kids here, you guys ever have growing pains? Right? Anyone, anyone ever feel those aches and pains and you're growing? And you're like, I don't want to go to lacrosse. And your parents are like, you're going. Yeah, but my legs hurt and my knees hurt. And what do they say? It's just growing pains. You're fine. You're okay. It's just growing pains. It's like, yeah, but whatever. It hurts. Why do I have to go to lacrosse? Because I said so. You know how that goes. Growing pains. It, it hurts to grow. To, to, in order to grow spiritually, I have to come to a realization that there are gaps and deficiencies and holes in my Christian life. I, I have to be able to say, I know I should be here after all these years, but in this area, this area, and this area, I'm still there. And, and that's just not something we like to admit. I, I think a lot of us, and myself included, we, we like to keep up a good exterior. We like to project that we, we have all the answers to the Bible study questions, and uh, our life is all together, and uh, we're doing fine, and how are you? Great. How are you? Great. And we don't like to admit that there's some real issues underneath, and so we kind of hide those. And, um, you know, even when people ask us, how are you doing? How, you know, anything you can, I can pray for? You know, it's, it's like a job interview where, where, you know, this question's always coming in a job interview, which is, what are your weaknesses? They always ask you that. You've got to know that. So you try to give them an answer that sounds like your weakness is actually a strength. That's the trick. So you've got to be like, well, you know, my weakness is sometimes I just work too hard. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I, I'm just a hard worker, and I need to sometimes not work as hard. And they're like, wow, even his weakness is awesome. Let's hire him. And, and we do that as Christians, where even, even our things we share, we, we sort of position them so that they sound kind of virtuous and spiritual, right? It's, it's the Facebook syndrome, where, where we you know, filter what we want to project out to the world and project a certain version of ourself that's sanitized and really happy and really like, man, everyone's life looks great on Facebook. You know, there's a studies that the more you look at Facebook, the more depressed you get. There's actual studies done because everyone's life looks awesome. And you're, you're like, man, everyone's life is awesome. My life is so boring. What's wrong with me? Because we, we project that, that image in that front. And so to grow... We have, to, we have to admit, like, I need to grow. We, we have to be, have the, the chutzpah to say, uh, okay, I'm going to be honest. I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. I should probably know that. I don't even know that. I'm sorry. I need to grow in, in these ways. And that's, that's hard, hard to own that. We, we have to not come to church or come to our Bible study or have conversations with one another with the, the mental posture and the spiritual posture as if we were in a job interview, All right? That, that's not, this is not job interview here. It's, it's not gathering together to try to impress God or impress one another and spin things so that I come off looking well. That's, that's not how we grow. And yet so often I think that's how we think of church and spirituality is, is that it's about selling ourselves and presenting ourselves well to, to the Lord and to one another. 
Instead, we need to see our coming together in church or in our Bible studies or in fellowship. We need to see it like not like we're all here waiting for our job interview with God, but more like we're all waiting in the waiting room at the doctor's office to visit the great physician. We're all here because we need help. God, I need help. That's why I'm in church. That's why I'm coming to the Bible study. That's why I'm leaning in, because I need to grow. There are gaps and deficiencies and weaknesses and sins and problems. And here's the awesome thing about Jesus. Jesus is attracted to repentant people. He always is moving toward the repentant. And he's always repelled by the self-righteous. You see it again and again. There's a story in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus shares the gospel with this tax collector. His name is Matthew. And he writes, Levi, Matthew. And he actually writes the gospel of Matthew later. But, you know, uh, tax collectors were bad. I mean, we, we don't like paying taxes sometimes either. But, but tax collectors back then were really, they were actually really bad. They, they, ex- they used their positions to exploit the poor. So they were exploitative. They took advantage of poor people. They were bad. And Jesus comes to this tax collector and he says, follow me. And so Matthew does and he leaves his life of sin behind and so Matthew throws a party. He's like, you guys got to meet Jesus. And so who are the kind of people who come to the party? All the other scumbags. Not nice people. Bad people. And he sort of, they all come together in this, this sort of collection of bad people and Jesus is there like having dinner with them and hanging out. And then along come the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And they go, why are you hanging out with the bad people? And Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is drawn toward the repentant and the sick. Not not that he, he doesn't see sin for sin. I think sometimes we have this vision of Jesus where he never judges or never sees right from wrong and he accepts everyone. That's not it. He moves forward in grace and he calls for repentance. Jesus is drawn toward us when we will say to him, not, hey, look at me, Jesus, what do you think? But we'll say to him, Jesus, I need help. There's still gaps. There's still holes and deficiencies. I need your grace. So I want to do an exercise with you. We're trying to get super practical here during this engage thing, really equip ourselves. So here's the exercise. Here's what you'll need. A piece of paper and a pencil. Pencils in the pew racks in front of you. You can use your bulletin. Tear, just don't tear a page out of the Bible, okay? Um, use, maybe use a, a bulletin from the person next to you. I think there's some sermon note things. And just find a piece of paper and number it one, two, three. Okay, you're not going to have to read this in front of the whole church. You're not going to have to show this to the person next to you. Don't worry. So it's all cool. Just take a piece of paper and number it one, two, three. And here's the first question. This is number one for you to think about. Where do you need to grow? Before you write anything, let me give you ideas. Not because I'm accusing you of this. I'm just saying these are ideas. These are areas. Okay, so here's ideas. Maybe you need to grow in um, salvation, Perhaps you've been coming here, you've been hearing about Jesus, but, but have, have you really come to faith in Jesus? And you're like, you know, I'd really like to believe in Jesus. I'd like to become a Christian. I think I may be Christian. I don't know if I am. I need to sort that whole thing out. So that's where you start is by faith in Christ. And so maybe that's where you're at in your growth is just taking that first step of, of giving your life to Christ and putting your faith in him. Maybe that's your first step. Or maybe you are a Christian and, and where you need to grow is uh, in the area of knowledge. You're like Apollos who knew a lot of stuff, but there were some, still some knowledge gaps. So, so maybe knowledge is where you want to grow. Now, now don't cop out on that one, okay? Because I know some of you are like, well, I've always wondered about the dinosaurs and the flood. There's knowledge. Not that. Who cares about that? Don't, don't do dumb trivia things. I mean, acknowledge like, here's some things that I need to know that I haven't figured out, and as a result, I'm kind of stuck in my faith. Like stuff that's really keeping you from growing, that kind of knowledge, not just sort of Bible trivia and who are the Nephilim and you know, stuff like that, like real knowledge. Or maybe a third area where you need to grow would be in practices, Christian practices, things that you know Christians do, but maybe you struggle with. Maybe you're 
one of those people who's like, I don't want to admit this, but I've been a Christian for 25 years, and I still really don't know how to pray regularly. And you don't want to say that because everyone's going to be like, what? But actually, the people around you are like, I have the same problem. <laughs> or maybe it's the practice of Bible reading. You know, I don't know how to commune with God. I don't know how to have fellowship with God in prayer and Bible study. Or maybe it's the practice of being baptized. Maybe you haven't been baptized as a believer. You know, you, you were baptized as a baby or something. That's not what we see in the Bible. We see in the Bible people are baptized as disciples, as Christians, as believers. Maybe you need to be baptized. And you've been a Christian for 30 years. You've just never dealt with that. Um, maybe you need to join a church or maybe you need to be in a Bible study with other Christians. Or, or maybe you, you need to practice the other Christian disciplines and uh, things like... like um, hospitality or tithing or serving others, you know, something like that where, you know, like, I know there's things Christians do and I've just never gotten that rhythm down and it's been a long time. Or maybe it's not salvation or knowledge or practice. Maybe where you need to grow is in one of your relationships as a fourth category is relationships. The Bible has a lot to say about how our Christianity should impact our relationships. So it has a lot to say about how our Christianity interfaces with being a husband or a wife or how it interfaces with being a, a child, a son or daughter. Or, or maybe you're single and it's like, I, I've never tried to connect my, my faith and really connect it into my dating. Right? I want those to go together. Or maybe it's your workplace. You know, you got your work life over here and your faith over here and you've never connected those and said, what does it look like to be a Christian in the workplace? And you haven't thought that through. So maybe there's one of those relationships that the Bible addresses. And you're like, I want to grow there. Or maybe, and here's the last category, then I'll let you write it down. Maybe it's just sin. Like, there's just some sin in my life I have been ignoring. There's like, you know, you're doing okay as a Christian, but there's this one infected, pussy pocket of sin, <laughs> right? That you just keep, like, hidden. And hey, I'm doing great, but there's this ugh, nasty part of your life. That, and we do that. We, we keep them hidden. I mean, look at these Christians in Ephesus after the, the botched exorcism that we'll look at next week on Mother's Day. Right? Look at that. It says in verse 18, many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. So this isn't pagan bad people confessing their evil deeds and becoming perfect Christians. This is believers who had junk and who are now like, okay, I'm going to bring it. And what was their junk? Sorcery. You know, you know Christians, you're like, Christians aren't supposed to practice magic, right? Right. If you're a Christian, don't practice magic. Bad. <laughs> and here's Christians practicing magic and sorcery and divination and astrology. And so they confess that. There's a this pussy pocket of sin that had to be lanced and cleaned out so that they could grow. What are, you, what are the sins you're wrestling with? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe you drink too much alcohol. You believe that Christians can drink within, within reason, but in reality, your drinking is nothing reasonable. Or maybe it's gambling that you're addicted to or pornography or looking at iPhones. You know screen? There's this new addiction, screens, right? iPhones, I mean, that, we can get addicted to everything. It's a new addiction people have to looking at screens. We can be addicted to all kinds of things. Maybe you have an anger problem. Maybe you, you rage or scream or blow up or you have a short fuse and people walk on eggshells around you because they don't know what's going to make you mad. Or maybe you're a gossip. Or maybe you're a, just a habitual people pleaser. You're always trying to make everyone happy, make everyone like you. and It's not living to please God. It's living to please others. Or maybe it's a double life. Or maybe you have a harsh cynical, critical spirit, that, that you have this bristly, tough exterior that you've used as a self-defense mechanism over the years because of your own brokenness inside. What is it? Is there sin in your life that needs to be repented of? And maybe that's it, where you need to grow. And there's just that one thing that God sees and you try to ignore, but it's there. So what is it? Where do you need to grow? Okay, take a minute, write it down. I'm not going to ask you to share it. I'm not going to ask you to show it to the person next to you. Just take a minute to write down where you might need to grow.
Okay, number two. Who is somebody who might help you grow? Can you think of the name of a person who might help you grow? Notice I didn't say for number two, what's your plan for growing? That's how we usually handle it. I've got these deficiencies. Uh Uh-oh, I better fix it before anyone else finds out about it. No, 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 no. This is grace. We need community. We need the ministry of others. Christian growth happens in community and relationship. Who could help you grow? I don't need any help, really. So that's why you've had this problem for 20 years. Because you're fine. Who could, you, who could help you? Who could you talk to? I don't know. Maybe you're like, I don't know, a pastor? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're happy to talk to anyone. Maybe there's someone else, though. Maybe there's someone you know that you trust that God would put on your heart. Who could help you grow? Maybe there is someone that you could take your little piece of paper and show it to and feel okay about that. And here's number three on the list. Who's someone that you could help grow? Or you could be the the Paul or the Priscilla and Aquila, and you could help them grow. Maybe there's just someone in your life, and you're like, wow, they really need help growth, uh, help in growing. Now, obviously, you, you don't walk up to that person and say, hey, I was thinking in church about how much you need to grow, and I kind of think God's sending me to you to help you not be so spiritually lame. You know, hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you kind of thing. I'm not saying that. But, but what do you do if you see someone has, has weaknesses? Well, you you engage, you press in, you talk to them, spend more time with them, you share your own struggles, and you just see where the Lord takes it. That's how you minister to people, even people who aren't asking for ministry. You just engage and press in, just like we do with evangelism, so we do with helping to grow. Who is it that God has put in your life that you think, I really could help this person? The Christian life is about growth. It's about growth in Jesus. It's about growth in the gospel. It's so exciting. God wants us to grow. Jesus is attracted to Christians who admit their need for growth. Jesus is attracted to people who say, Jesus, I need help, and to seek his grace. During the uh, 1700s here in in Boston and in the colonies and in England, there was what uh, historians call the Great Awakening. You've probably heard of it. It's a remarkable time. Uh, two great pillars of the... There's a lot of people who, whom God used, but the two great leading lights, the two great pillars of the Great Awakening were George Whitfield and John Wesley. And these two, these two guys were used by God to, to preach the gospel like literally to hundreds and thousands and millions of people long before there was an internet, long before there was mass media, long before gospel blimps. They were the gospel blimp, all right? They just, they rode around everywhere. George Whitfield died up on the North Shore of Boston in his, his 50s. He just basically kind of preached himself to death. Just, he, ex- he exhausted himself from preaching. They, just, they preached, they preached the gospel. But, but what you often don't know about is that is in the Great Awakening, it was not only a great season of evangelism, but it was also a great season of discipleship. Because on the back side of that, especially John Wesley, John Wesley was really good at this. He was great at organizing disciples and dis- of, of these new people who come to faith and discipling them. So he had all these, these, these colonists and all these uh, people from England coming to faith in Jesus, but a lot of the churches were sick and dead, and so they couldn't say, hey, go to that church. So what he did was, John Wesley, he started these societies. And he'd get people in these societies, these people who come to faith, and he'd get them together to disciple them. And the societies were broken down into classes. And so you had your class, there were 12 people in the class, you had the class leader. And, and it wasn't just a, a Bible study, it was like intentional discipleship community where they, they would get into each other's lives and say like, what are you doing with this? Where are you wrestling with that? How's this going? How's that going? And, and they would push each other. They, they had a, a, a method they followed. And in fact, the, the method, they, they were so intent on their method, their intentionality, that, that this whole thing, these societies, became known as Methodism. They followed a method. And then eventually, Methodism became a denomination that we call Methodist today. But before Methodist was Methodist, it was Methodism. And before it was a movement, it was just trying to disciple people, <laughs> trying to get them to be intentional. And so, you know, we, we hear method and we kind of, maybe that sounds weird. So use, use a modern word, intentionality. And so a movement started of intentionalism. And maybe, maybe it could have become the denomination of intentionalist. 
you know, I'm an intentionalist. But that's the idea. It's, it's we're not just coasting along in our Christian life. We want to get into these communities and disciple each other. Maybe, maybe we at South Shore Baptist Church need to get a little bit Methodist. We need to be intentional about growing in our faith. I wonder if, if there were to be another great awakening in New England and God were to bless that. I wonder if we're ready for it. I, you know, we want people to be saved. We want God to move. That's great. But we have to start with our own hearts and say, am I growing? Am I on the path? And Because if I'm not on the path and I'm growing in the path, how can I say to other people, you guys should really walk the path? It's great. And so I need to start with myself and we need to start with our own hearts and pray that God would, would cleanse us and work in our lives to help us be obedient disciples so that we might be vessels through which he might use us to bring another awakening. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give us a desire to grow. We pray that our desire for growth would be greater than our desire for comfort, our desire for hiding. That, Lord, we would desire you in whatever it takes, Lord, that, Lord Jesus, you'd be more attractive to us than the approval of people. Lord Jesus, that you'd be more attractive to us than a, a romantic relationship. That, Jesus, you'd be more attractive to us than... Um, money or pleasure or anything the world has to offer. And that, Lord, that desire to know you, Jesus, to treasure you, would pull us forward in growth. And so, God, show your glory to our hearts. Help us to grow. Lord, pinpoint specific things through your Holy Spirit that you want to change in us. God, call us into community with each other to be more intentional about helping each other. I thank you for how even I heard after the first service that people already talking to each other about how to grow. God, may that just continue in our church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.